so uh, Fiona Whitaker uh, uh, on uh, some diving work basically in Young Limestones with Pete Smart, uh, Trish Beddows and, uh, and Sam Smith. So Fiona, fire away. Thank you very much, John. Um, so this is a, a sort of, gosh, it's bright, a report on some work that's really been going on since the ni- late 1980s. That makes it 30 years, which is quite scary. Um, much of it in the Bahamas, some in the Yucatan. More recently, I've been working in Bonaire and also in Guam. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a whole spectrum of work. And we're going to focus on cave development in relatively young limestones. So I need to find this thing. Let's see that. So we've had some great talks yesterday, and we've got some more coming today, on continental carbonates. So what we've heard lots about caves. We haven't heard much about the rocks in which they form. One of the characteristics about most of the caves we've looked at, I've been looking, there have been wonderful photographs, and I've been like, oh, that's really thick bedded, and that has a lot of fracture breccia at the back. People generally don't look too much at the rock, they look at the holes. But the rocks are really important for understanding the nature of the caves and where you find them. So typically, most of the caves we've been hearing about today yesterday and we'll hear about today, have been in rather old limestones. There have been limestones that have been buried and then uplifted. And as a result of that, they're typically quite hard. You hit them with a hammer and they ring. Um, They have low porosity, apart from not at the scale we're walking around in, obviously. But if you you look at a hand sample of rock, it's pretty tight. They're very strong. They're quite well-jointed. Hence, they can support large caves, as Pete and Rue are going to tell you tomorrow. Tomorrow, later on, this afternoon. Um, I think Andy showed you this slide on the left-hand side, um, which is a summary of the major processes driving dissolution of these well-cemented, well-jointed rocks. They're driven by CO2, generated mostly near the surface, within the soil and in the subsoil. That generates the soil air that James was telling you about yesterday and drives dissolution. We don't need to go through the reactions. But the important thing is that the nature of the rock is really important in determining both the surface landforms, or the classic cast landforms we talk about, and in focusing, uh, we get the dissolution occurring along bedding plane fissures and fractures. It's very focused, and that's why we get nice caves. As a result, we tend to get linear conduits. We can walk along a cave, for a long way, hopefully. Um, Those caves often form under relatively high hydraulic gradients. The, The water table dips relatively steeply and they tend to be vertically stacked so we've seen some beautiful examples where we've got older caves at high elevation and then as base level as the river outside is eroding down the caves develop progressively over time so the younger caves are the shallow ones the low elevation ones and the older caves are the high elevation ones I'm allowed to start talking now John thank you for the extra time um, so we've heard um, Colin gave us a, a lovely summary of the work that's been done in Mulu. Mulu is, is a classic example of caves that develop as these sort of dendritic or rectilinear mazes. They link together recharge points, in this case where the river's coming off um, Gunung Mulu, are recharging into Gunung Api, dissolving the caves and the outlets where the rivers um, come to the surface again. And this is some work from Andy's thesis, actually. This is a long time ago in the 1990s when Andy and Pete and I... Oh, well, never mind. Uh, Andy and Pete and I did some some work in Mulu, dating, uh, using paleomagnetic dating. We were looking at these reversals of iron particles where they point north or south. And that was used to date those caves. So we find... And Andy's done some more recent work, which is fitting in beautifully with this, which suggests, again, oldest caves at high elevation, uh, younger caves at progressively lower elevation. So we can date landscape evolution, as Mike pointed out yesterday. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look in the other direction. So I would suggest that all, most of the talks we've been looking at so far have been looking at continental carbonates. We're going to look at coastal carbonates. Now, these are carbonates um, that are deposited mostly in subtropical to tropical environments, and they're caves that develop in those very young limestones. And as a result of the much younger age of those limestones, the characteristics of the caves tend to be quite different, and we're going to look at why that might be the case. I'm going to focus, as I said, on examples in the Bahamas and the Yucatan, um, but we've also worked on elsewhere. The Red Stars uh, in the Mediterranean has migrated a bit, but we've got caves in Miocene limestones in Mallorca that form through a similar set of processes. So, 
Uh, I'm going to take you back in time. The Andros project was a project initiated by Rob Palmer. It occurred in 1987, and several people in this audience were there, and it's lovely to see you all again. Um, so we're going to look at some examples on South Andros, which is where we went for this big Andros project that Rob Palmer uh, motivated and ran. And then we're going to look at also some caves in, the, caves in the Turks and Caicos, which James mentioned, actually. He's been to more recently than we have. So one of the critical factors about these rocks, these sediments, um, is that the time between the deposition of the rocks and the formation of caves can be really very short. It can be as little as a few thousand years. So we start off with some sediment. This is some sed uids, uids forming on a, a beach in the Bahamas, accumulating on a beach in the Bahamas. Within a thousand years, those can become cemented so that you can actually scramble up the side. They might break off a bit, but we've got hard rocks within a thousand years. So what happens is what you can see is we've got a whole series of little islands here. Um, at some point, those were below sea level, or the sediment was formed below sea level, and it's been piled up on the islands. But you can see the low topographic um, variation there. So you don't need much of a change in sea level to go from being in a carbonate-producing, a sediment-producing factory beneath the sea to that sediment being exposed by a drop in sea level or being washed up onto a beach or being blown to form dunes. And... We don't have a whole time series in the Bahamas and other places because sea level's been yo-yoing up and down. So we go to the next oldest rocks, and the next oldest rocks are not very old either. They're only about 125,000 years old. But already they're lithified enough to make these quite substantial cliffs. You know, these processes that turn sediments to rocks happen very fast. And not surprisingly, once you've got some rocks like that, maybe we can get some caves forming in them. Maybe I can learn which button to press. Oh, no. That's going from a Mac. You've lost the most beautiful picture in the middle there. How frustrating. Never mind. Um, so what you were supposed to see on the top was a, a beautiful transition from grains, um, from uh, the beach in the Bahamas, uh, through to the Holocene, which is the missing diagram, where you should have been seeing some beautiful ooids. These are little beautiful spherical grains. They're about... Oh, sorry, it doesn't work, does it? They're about, there's a laser pointer. They're about half a mil, uh, there we go, half a centimetre across. And what starts to happen in this missing slide is these ooids start to have a little fringe of cement forming around them. And that very small amount of cement is enough to start them sticking together and behaving like proper rocks. And then over time, as we get to the Pleistocene, this is an example of a core from the Pleistocene, we're getting quite a lot more cement. But in fact, the ooids themselves, which are formed of a, a different minerality, the form of aragonite, they tend to dissolve out quite easily. So we've got stabilization of some of the primary minerals, like aragonite and high mag calcite, to a lower magnesium calcite, which will last over time. And what you can see in this diagram here is the log of time against the porosity. So we start off with our ooid sand, and over time, the porosity of some of this rock increases. Uh, you can see if you measured it at a small enough scale, the porosity would be 100% inside this fog. Um, in, in other places, it cements up. So we get an, an increase in heterogeneity over time. It's more variable from space to space. So these are thin sections. These are really small scales. So obviously, it depends where you take your thin section. You don't take it through a hole, because there ain't no rock... To, uh, to look at. And what you can see in this diagram is we're not looking at porosity, we're looking at the permeability, the ability of the rock to conduct fluids. And that's on our y-axis here, that's the log of permeability against the log of the scale at which we look at things. So that blue bar represents the sort of set scale we might be looking at fresh sediment, but if we look at little cores taken from rocks, in this case, these are Pleistocene limestones, so they're 125,000 years, sometimes quite a lot older from some of the older high sea stands. Um, you can see a lower permeability. And then as we move from left to right on this plot, what we're doing is we're looking at a progressively larger volume of rock. If you look at a large enough volume of rock, you're likely to hit a cave. And as a result of that, what you can see is that the permeability increases. So when you pump groundwater out of a borehole or when you model the thickness of a freshwater lens on an island, then what's controlling the permeability of the rock is the presence of caves. So we have a very strong scale dependence. It depends on what scale you look at, um, how, what the ability of these rocks is to conduct fluids. 
So in contrast to our traditional continental cast, which are old, get uplifted after burial, here we're looking at young, diagenetically immature, quite reactive rocks. They're not well cemented. They're actually quite poorly cemented. And they have quite a high matrix porosity. The matrix is the bit in between the caves, the bit we don't generally look at too much, unless you're a geologist. They tend to have a relatively low mechanical strength because they've not been so well cemented. And as a result of that, they're less well jointed. Okay, so what? That's a bit of geology. I apologize on a Sunday morning if that's too much geology. Um, but it has important implications. It has important implications for the nature of castification at the land surface. So instead of some of this sort of classic spectacular dolines and tower cast, what you get in these islands, especially this is, this is in the Bahamas on Andros Island, the average land surface elevation is 0.7 meters above sea level. This is not somewhere you go for a mountaineering holiday. Uh, what you get is this very subdued surface cloth cast. The um, dissolution, instead of being focused along fissures and fractures, is disseminated across the surface. So you can see the little... Um, these are caminitsas, we get little surface pockets. Um, these develop into something that's termed locally banana holes because they're the only place on the surface there's any chance of soil surviving, and that's where the locals therefore go and plant their bananas. But we do have spectacular cast. That's why we went there on the Andros project. This is Stargate Blue Hole on um, South Andros, and this is um, Lucayan Caverns on Grand Bahama, and this is what's known as the Black Hole. It's one of the big cenotes. I think that one's about a kilometre across or so on the western side of Andros Island. So we get large-scale features as well, and we've seen that in our scale dependence of permeability. So there's something else going on here. It's not just dissolution of individual grains and small-scale development of matrix porosity. So what might drive our dissolution? Well, it rains in the Bahamas. It rains quite a lot when it rains, so this is a typical storm coming in. At this point, you're thinking, oh, my God, I need to get my nice, expensive chemistry kit into the car very, very quickly. What happens when it rains, you can imagine what happens when it rains here, is the rain infiltrates very rapidly into the subsurface. So what we're seeing here is a change in water level, so it's the elevation of the water table, as a fraction of the maximum water level change. And the important thing is all of these graphs, they're all standardized to one, they all peak very rapidly. Within a few hours, almost all that rain has reached the water table. And then what happens is it declines, the elevation of the water table declines pretty rapidly. And it's doing that because we're on an island. So when it rains on the top of our body of fresh water, we're increasing the weight of the freshwater lens. Now, the freshwater lens is a body of fresh water that floats essentially on top of this sponge of rock with salt water underneath. So as you raise the water table base, say, four centimetres, what you're going to do is push the base of that freshwater lens down um, by 40 times that. So I shouldn't have chosen four centimetres, I should have chosen ten, and then it would have gone down four centimetres. Anyway, so what happens is the water goes very, very quickly to the water table. That's the important point from this slide. So one of the things that we've done relatively recently, so we started working in the Bahamas back in 86. It's my first trip out there. Um, so we're still working in the Bahamas because it's like a natural laboratory. And the more you know about it, the more you can learn incrementally when you keep going back. So you, we wait a bit, your ideas change, you go back and test a whole new set of ideas. And one of the things we've been doing recently um, with a whole load of... Uh, well, a couple of PhD students as we've been running around trying to understand what drives dissolution, how the system responds to these uh, heavy, intense rainfall events. And that involves, you get very twitchy about rain. Even now, I, can, I sort of look out the window and thought, oh, it's raining, quick, I need to go out there with my plastic sheet and chase rain. Um, so we've been sampling rainfall. This isn't now in South Andros, this is in North Andros. And that's an important distinction because a lot of North Andros is covered by this pine vegetation. So you've got an understory and you've got some very sparse pines. So here you can see a sort of schematic of the sorts of samples we've been collecting. We collected rainfall. Uh, we collected throughfall, which is the stuff that falls through the canopy. We collected, we did, we really did. There we go. Uh, we collected water as it ran down the stems of trees, which is great. I think it's great fun. It's it, a science. It's great science to do. Um, and one of the things we discovered in doing that is that this stem flow is absolutely critical uh, in terms of driving dissolution. So this is the pH 
negative log of base 10 of hydrogen ion concentration. Most of our groundwaters we were expecting to be 7 to 8. That's what we've measured previously. We were hoping for acid rain. Well, there's so much carbonate dust in the atmosphere that the rain is not actually terribly acidic. But if you sample the water as it goes down the bowls of the trees, the, the, the tree trunks, then you're getting pHs. I mean, there's 43 samples here. So that's a pretty low standard deviation of around pH 4. So a lot of the acids that are driving dissolution in the system are humic and fulvic acids that come down the tree stems. There we go. Uh, so we kept going. We're having a great time. It was one particularly very, very rainy day. Um, and we had this fantastic storm. So we sampled overland flow running off the rock surface. Uh, we... We, I spent a long time very, very wet in these muddy holes, which are these banana holes I talked about. So dissolution holes where the soil accumulates. These fill up with water when it rains. Uh, we also went to these very shallow case systems. So this is the sort of thing Jules was talking about. Just below the land surface, there are caves developed. They don't tend to go very far. They're not terribly spectacular, but they give you a way of sampling the water as it percolates through the unsaturated Orvedo zone. Uh, and then we worked quite a lot on observation boreholes. So we were looking at different depths below the water surface. And what we found there, this is a plot of the calcium ion concentration, is that stem flows might be really acidic, but they've not got much calcium in. They haven't had a chance to react yet. But as soon as those waters start flowing over the ground surface and then through into the caves and the dissolution holes and the observation boreholes, then the calcium ion concentration increases very rapidly. So we've, we've found that organic acids are the major drive for dissolution near the surface, but almost all of that acidity is neutralized pretty close to the ground surface. Now, the water table is also very close to the ground surface, but there isn't much drive from the surface to drive dissolution below the water table. That's quite different from your classic cast. So do all our caves form at the water table? Uh, this is Rob Palmer, dressed to do cave science. I mean, sort of cave science high tech in 1986 or 7. Um, and I'm taking you now to, so we can look at the dissolutional potential of the waters below the water surface. Um, and we're going to look at, we actually did a study in a series of different blue holes distributed along this um, bank marginal fracture system. So here we are. We're down on South Andros um, off the east coast here. There's a very steep drop-off down to almost two kilometers in this deep blue water. This is the tongue of the ocean. So that's the drop-off here. We've got the reefs. It's the third largest barrier reef in the world. And the whole side of the platform is starting to, to um, fall off. And as a result, we've got these spectacular blue holes which give us vertical access to the water. Um, so what we did is we went we were diving with these very convenient tubes, which are a great way of getting really big water samples, which we needed back then. Um, and what we were going to look at initially is what happens at the water table and below the water table. So the salinity in red is pretty constant. The blue line's disappeared, but the blue line shows the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the water. Now, this is a negative log. So as we go from right to left, it's actually increasing, which if you're not used to PCO2, that's well worth remembering. So what we can see at the surface of the water table is we have the lowest PCO2, and PCO2 is increasing with depth. So what's happening here is that the water, so the same water that James is looking at the, uh, the cave in Turks and Caicos, is actually degassing into the ground air. So um, our work has suggested it's not actually the ground air itself and the bugs in the ground air that are generating CO2, although undoubtedly they are, but we've actually got our highest CO2 in the groundwater, and it's moving upwards. So that may well be a, a relatively simple, but I, I suspect clear explanation for why the CO2 is varying in the nice way that James saw yesterday. And we can see what effect this has on the water chemistry. This is saturation index, right? So that the waters at chemical equilibrium of the rock should be sitting around here, which they are in most of our freshwater lens. As we go to the right, the waters are becoming super saturated. They're going to try and uh, precipitate calcite. As they go to the left, that's where caves are going to form. These waters are not forming caves. In fact, the degassing of CO2 is driving cementation, and at the surface of a lot of our caves, we actually get calcite rafts forming due to this degassing process. Now, if we keep going on down, so our cave is effectively giving a vertical section through the freshwater lens, through this mixing zone between fresh and salt water and down into the salt water. 
So here you can see salinity constant through the lens, increases in a linear form through the mixing zone, then it's constant again in the saline zone below. So what happens in terms of the chemistry is that the PCO2 actually increases within the mixing zone before it drops again. And if we look at the saturation index, we've gone from supersaturation at the water table to equilibrium with aragonite, which is the least stable mineral, so it's going to be controlling the chemical system. And then within the mixing zone in blue here, this red arrow is pointing to the fact these lines are all trending into the zone of undersaturation. So this is where our dissolution is happening. This is where our caves are forming. They're forming at the interface between the fresh and the salt water. So why? Why do caves form there? Why do we get this undersaturation? Well, if we take two waters, the blue dot represents a water at equilibrium with the rock in the fresh water, and the red dot is a water at equilibrium with the rock, which is dominantly calcite down here, in the salt water. We mix them together. This is the relationship between the carbon dioxide partial pressure and the amount of calcium at equilibrium. Those two waters mix on a straight line, but the equilibrium curve is that, exactly that. It's a curve. So you mix two points along a straight line. You get to water C in the mixing zone, and that's undersaturated. And that's why you get dissolution in mixing zones. This slide. This is the diver. This is a diver swimming along at a mixing zone. And the line you can see there isn't the air water surface. That's actually the top of the mixing zone. You can see the mixing behind his fins here. But you can also see the characteristic form of the wall rock in these caves. And people talk about Swiss cheese fretting because it's full of holes at a smaller scale than you can dive through. Um, so this is a sort of being geologist. You go down, you make sketches underwater as best you can. And you can see that we've got a little bit of case hardening and some interesting things going on in our freshwater lens. But when we get into our mixing zone, we get a lot of this Swiss cheese fretting. And we also get this really interesting black coating as a sufficient crust in the lower part of the mixing zone before popping out into the places where you get the photographs taken because it's, the water is clear and the rock is white. Now, if we look at thin sections again, these are little slices through the rock. You can see we've impregnated the rock with this blue epoxy resin. Anything that's blue or white is whole, and anything that's red is your rock. So there's not a lot of rock left. You know, this rock is having a really hard time to stay in one piece. Um, what you can see at the bottom here, which has come out really badly, are some little cubes of framboidal pyrite with some evidence of bacterial activity. So this sort of links into stuff that Hazel's going to talk about in the next talk. Uh, so the organic matter story is really important in the mixing zone as well. In fact, if we run... So I haven't told you about this. I thought I'd miss it out, but I can't resist telling you. If you run some geochemical models of this mixing process, they generate under saturation, but they don't generate nearly as much under saturation as we actually see in the waters. Um, so what we can see is there are actually a number of processes going on. The organics that are derived at the surface are raining down through the water column, and then they meet this zone, um, the mixing zone, where you've got a big increase in density. Uh, so some of them get suspended in the density gradients of the mixing zone. They pro that provides a food source uh, for bacteria. The bacteria oxidize the organic matter, generating acidity. And that's why we get this maximum peak in CO2 in our mixing zone. The next thing that happens is all those bacteria are using up the oxygen. They're eating all this food. Thank you very much. Free lunch. We're really enjoying this. But we're now we're running out of oxygen, which is our primary electron, except that generates the most energy. So we start reducing the next thing down the chain, and that happens to be sulfate. So you get sulfate reduction, generating hydrogen sulfide, and a bit more acidity. Uh, in fact, we generate H2S, and potentially what that does, well, definitely what that does, that explains our pyrite, um, but it also those um, reduced sulfur species then diffuse through a concentration gradient towards the redox interface where you've got oxygen present again. They get reoxidized, um, and that gives us another, it gives us a source of sulfuric acid that increases the dissolution. So there's neat things going on, and we can actually go and measure the dissolution rates. So these are little pills of different, this is calcite, aragonite, and dolomite. This is Ian Fairchild's dolomite, in fact. Um, and we suspended these at different places through Stargate and several other caves on, um, all the way through the Bahamas. And they clearly demonstrated that although we've got some dissolution at depth in our freshwater lens, we've got maximum dissolution occurring in the mixing zone. These experiments were run for between three and five years, right? So this is a significant amount of weight loss. And then we've got some precipitation occurring in the saline zone, which I've cut slides out, so I couldn't tell you about. It's really cool. 
So the host rock is different. The processes driving dissolution are different. Does that mean we get a different cave morphology compared to our continental cast? Uh, we're going to look initially at um, a cave in Middle Caicos. Here we go. Uh, this is Middle Caicos. This is a, a photograph that shows you from these cliffs. So these are Aeolian dunes that have been lithified. Um, you do get, as airfield caves, they tend to occur on the flanks of these dune ridges around the coast, and they develop below sea level. So at a time when sea level was higher than it is at the moment, um, in the mixing zone. Let's move quickly on. So this is Conk Bar Cave that James has also been working more recently. It's the longest subaerial to bay cave system in the Bahamas. It's three kilometers long. Bits of it are dry. It's a dry smart for scale. Bits of it get soggier and soggier. I think this is a soggy me for scale. Um, but characteristically, these caves are... Uh, they have big chambers, and then they have these weird passages that go off and dead end. It, they don't behave like caves should behave. They're not what we're used to at all. Some of those passages loop back round again. Um, and we do have a series of levels, which I don't have time to talk to you about. We have older levels. Um, well, we have higher levels. Um, and we also have lower levels. And we'll have a look at those levels in a minute. But maybe Kongbar Cave is not the best place to go. Because the potential for dissolution here in our mixing zone is a function of how much water is discharging. And that's a function of how much rain falls on the island. Big island, lots of water has to discharge at the coast, lots of potential for mixing zone dissolution. So although in Middle Caicos, it's possibly four kilometers wide, the island, uh, at high sea stands, when these caves formed, it was actually only that high elevation dune ridge that formed an island. So it's quite a small island, not much potential. We've still got quite big caves. Uh, if we go up to Grand Bahama and we look at Lacayan Caverns, for example, there's more than, four, I think more than 14 now kilometers of back passage. And this island's a bit wider. Um, but if we move over here to Quintana Roo on the east side of the Yucatan, then we're on an attached platform. We've got a, a potentially quite a large hinterland of fresh water that's all going to be discharging towards the coast. And not surprisingly, we see a hell of a lot of mixing zone cast there. So uh, Ursh Balhar is one system we've worked at, for example. My daughter Lucy did lots of research last night to get the updated lengths for some of these caves, and she tells me with authority, being an arts student, um, that it's now 270 kilometres long, which is pretty impressive. That's all underwater. That's all surveyed by cave divers, not me. Um, so this is a paper that, that Pete led back in 2006, and we did some work with Trish and Sam looking at cave development along a 100-kilometre or so stretch of the um, coast of Quintana Roo here. Uh, so again, these are more updated figures than there were in the paper. There's a hell of a lot of cave there. And it all formed, we think, it all formed in the mixing zone. So let's have a look. This is, this is one area between Tulum, which you may, if you've been there, that's a place with lots of wonderful Mayan temples, and Shell Ha. So we're looking at this small area. Look how much cave there is. There's an awful lot more cave now. And there's some cave that we knew about then we couldn't put on the map because it was all hush-hush. Um, what's the nature of those caves? Well, what you can see here is a plan view, and look at all these cross-sections. The HC marks the halocline. That's the mixing zone. So you can see in these spectacular pictures, that's the mixing zone. And the caves are basically being enlarged laterally at the position of the halocline in all those cases. Um, so we've got a series of... It's a largely horizontal system. You can go into rooms where you can shine your light around and think, why is the ceiling still the ceiling and not falling on my head? Um, those caves are often full of sediment, nasty speleothem that gets in the way, but it's all jolly useful for the dating work that Pete and Dave Richards at Bristol have been doing. Um, we've looked at ceiling level data. So this is a section of Mayan blue cave. These are the collapses, the cenotes. Uh, but what you can see, coloured in different shades of grey here, sorry, not coloured at all, they're in different shades of grey, represent different elevations of cave passage development. So the cave passage, the mixing zone looks like, oh, it gets deeper as you go from the coast, but remember those diagrams are hugely vertically exaggerated. It's pretty well flat. It's like a buzzsaw, the mixing zone. It's just eating its way through the limestone. Uh, ooh, so I should have said the really important thing is that means, yes, I know, thank you, John, that the, the sea level, as it goes up and down through time, this is 450,000 years, you can see sea levels being buzzing up and down at a huge rate of knots. At each relative still stand in sea level, the mixing zone is going to get to work, and it's going to develop a new set of caves. So the caves don't get progressively younger 
like they do in continental systems. They're formed at all sorts of different times, but eventually, as you get more and more sediments accumulating, those sediments, the, the limestones, are buried finally below the zone which the mixing zone can get to them. The final feature of these caves is cave roof collapse. So you can see there's some bells developing here with a little entrance. Um, not surprisingly, this rock is not well cemented. It will collapse. You have lots and lots of collapses which provide entrances for, for exploring the caves. So this collapse tends to be associated with this geochemical buzzsaw in the mixing zone. Um, so you get this lateral expansion of the passages. The rock is not terribly strong. I've shown you some photographs of the weakest bits, but even the strongest bits are not very strong. And in particular, what that means is sea level's relatively high at the moment. If you drop sea level, all the support that the water is giving the rock is going to disappear. And it's going to go, oh, like I'm going to do when I give this talk and I finally have some coffee. So what that does... Shut up is you get a stacked series. This is a complicated diagram. I have three minutes, so I'm not going to run you through it. But basically, you can see as sea level goes up and down and carbonates accumulate, what you end up in the long term is a series of stacked cave systems. And what this doesn't show is how horizontal they are because there's this ridiculous vertical exaggeration because we're trying to explain points. So finally, continental caves and Coastal caves are really quite different. The nature of the limestones is different, and that's really important because it controls the routing of the water. Uh, the, very, uh, the second fact is that they've got seawater close by. So a coast or an island limestone, you'll have this mixing between fresh and salt water. You've also got to understand what the bacteria are doing, which segues nicely into Hazel's talk. And as a result of that, the caves look very different. We need to explore for them in a different way, aside from most of them currently being underwater, which makes the exploration a bit more fun. I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much.